Well, welcome. Thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It sort of seems like Groundhog Day to me because, you know, the, this new Tim Pawlenty is really no different than the old Tim Pawlenty, a guy who speaks out of both sides of his mouth, gets up and says a few weeks ago that he's going to lead on the opioid crisis, and then when pressed on the issue this last week, said that he had no comment. This is very familiar to most of us as Minnesotans who remember his time as governor who said he was going to lead on a whole host of issues, only to see that he would do the other otherwise. So I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the Minnesota Nurses Association President uh, Mary Turner and Lexi Reed Holtum from the Steve Rumler Hope Network for joining me here today to talk about this critical issue. Opioid addiction is ravaging communities across Minnesota. It's leaving tragic deaths and heartbroken families in this state. Opioid overdose deaths have skyrocketed in recent years, increasing 66% between 2010 and 2016. Nearly 400 Minnesotans lost their lives to opioid overdoses in the last year alone. Mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons gone too soon. We need to act on this emergency with the seriousness and resources it demands. And that means there needs to be a joint effort from states, the federal government, and the very drug companies that helped create this crisis in the very first place. That is why there is a bipartisan bill moving at the state capitol to charge the big pharmaceutical companies a penny for every opioid pill they sell in Minnesota. This common sense proposal would require large pharmaceutical companies to contribute a very small amount of their enormous profits to address this crisis in our state. The funding would go towards prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts critical to saving lives in Minnesota, and it would help deter the overprescription of opioids in our communities. As I mentioned a moment ago, when Tim Pawlenty kicked off his campaign, he claimed he would hold the big, Trump, the big drug companies accountable for their role in the opioid crisis. Yet just last week, when he was asked whether he supports the penny a pill proposal, Pawlenty declined, declined to comment. This is a bipartisan proposal moving forward through the legislature, and Tim Pawlenty once again showed that he was unwilling to lead on this serious issue. That begs some serious question. Is a penny too much, Tim Pawlenty? Is it because you depend on big pharma for big donations? If you won't support this common sense proposal, what in the world would you support? Are you willing to stand up to the special interests who fund your campaign to save the lives of Minnesotans? Voters deserve these answers. We're here today to call on Tim Pawlenty to answer these questions and, most importantly, to support the Penny a Pill proposal. If he's serious about holding pharmaceutical companies accountable and helping suffering commu communities, he needs to back this bill. With that, it's my honor to introduce my friend, the president of the Minnesota Nurses Association, who's just off of four straight shifts, night, night shifts. So uh, um, she's been working hard, but Mary knows probably more than anyone uh, the serious, serious uh, consequences of inaction on this opioid crisis. Please welcome Mary Turner. Like Ken said, my name is Mary Turner. I'm president of the United, uh, Minnesota Nurses Association, but more importantly, I'm a night shift nurse in the intensive care at North Memorial Level 1 Trauma in Robbinsdale, Minnesota. And I worked the night shift, just got off at 7.30, and I spent the last four nights seeing what we see every single night. One-third, 34%, of the intensive care admissions are due to some kind of drug, opioid, or substance abuse overdose. And you can consistently go to any floor, any ICU throughout the state and, and verify this fact. One, 34 percent. This, this tragedy that nurses see on a nightly or a daily basis cannot be tolerated anymore. We can't be, our hospitals, our emergency rooms, and our intensive cares cannot be the answer to the opioid crisis. We have to have preventive 
We have to have care afterwards. Right now, in Minnesota, well, all over the nation, we're just dealing with it in a crisis mode in all of our emergency rooms and our intensive cares, and this cannot be tolerated. And the reason is, as of 2009, I looked up the average stay for an opioid crisis in an intensive care was $58,000. By 2015, that price had gone to $92,000. I can only imagine in 2018 that it's well over $100,000 to take care of one person in the ICU in an opioid crisis. This money, this money could be used for, and, and the thing is, is that people with their insurance coverage that they have, or lack of insurance com coverage, or the counties are having to foot the bill for this, or our hospitals are, 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 are not, not getting paid. And we cannot sustain this kind of cost. This money should be better spent on our schools, and on our roads, and our infrastructure, and, and anything else but dealing with a crisis that shouldn't be. But I'll just give you a heads up on how it happened. I remember I worked at Abbott Northwestern back in the late 90s. And I remember an eight hour uh, in service on um, pain management that was put on by the drug companies. And it was at that point that I first heard the words MS cotton and oxycodone. That was the first time that the nurses heard this concept of zero to 10 pain and everyone needed to be pain free. This is the first time we heard that you'd have long acting MS cotton and then oxycodone for breakthrough pain. Gone was the Tylenol, gone was the, the ice packs and all that. Sure, you kind of used it, but they really pushed it. And I know when I mentioned this to uh, Senator Eaton, I mean, they served us a huge breakfast and lunch, and they would have given us dinner and drinks if they could. And she said to me after, she goes, Mary, I remember. She goes, I remember that they took us all out for this huge steak dinner. My point was that they spent millions of dollars in indoctrinating the nurses and the doctors into this new way of pain management. And it has affected the way we do nursing for the last two decades. And now we have this crisis. They've made billions and billions of profits. And I'm not gonna say they're, well, I am gonna say that they should be responsible with this penny a pill, penny a pill, that would generate what? $20 million, which is probably nothing to them, they need to be held accountable. And our legislators and our politicians who don't agree with that, they need to answer to the voters. Because th this is a tragedy that needs to be fixed. And with that, I will Thank you. Thank you. That's, um, <clears throat> Really powerful testimony, Mary, and um, thank you so much for the good work that you do. And I know it must be very exhausting and heartbreaking on a daily basis to continue to show up and know that there are things, there are solutions to the opioid crisis in our country, and one of the biggest barriers is funding. Um, so my name is Lexi Reed Holtum, and I am the executive director of the Steve Rumler Hope Network. I told Mary I'd introduce myself. So she sleep deprived and all, didn't have to mispronounce my name, um, which often happens. And um, so the mission at the Steve Rumler Hope Network is to heighten the awareness of the disease of addiction as it relates to the physical and emotional burdens of chronic pain and to improve the associated care process. So I'm going to give you some stats, too, just to kind of keep it in a nutshell and then talk a little bit about the legislation where it's at right now. Um, and then just circle back to what Mary so eloquently just said, that our legislators, they need to be held accountable for how they vote. And um, I think one of the best ways for that to be translated to the American public is through all of you. 
So thank you for choosing to be here today to do the good reporting that we need to do to create the public awareness for calls to action of our elected officials to make the right decisions. Um, and as you stated already, this is a bipartisan bill, but yet we see complete breakdowns in the House, which is impacting the Senate. Um, and I'll talk about that in a nutshell in a moment. So every three weeks, the opioid crisis kills the same number of people that were killed in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Every three weeks, the opioid crisis in America kills the same number of people that were killed in the 9-11 terrorist attacks. In 2016 alone, there were the same number of overdose deaths as all of the Americans killed in the two decades of the Vietnam War. Imagine, if you will, every day in our country, an airplane falling from the sky and everybody on board dying. That is the number of deaths we are experiencing in our country on a daily basis. Now, if that were actually occurring, we would hold that industry accountable for creating the solutions. If an airplane was falling from the sky and everybody was dying every single day, our country would hold that industry accountable for creating the solutions so that that no longer happened. We are absolutely unequivocally experiencing this crisis because of industry influence from opioid manufacturers. I'm going to give you some facts as to how we got here. So this isn't this opioid crisis is not a natural disaster. It's not something that we couldn't have predicted. It is something that we've been aware of for the last two decades. Our question is why, is the, why are our elected officials and our government agencies not holding opioid pharma responsible for contributing to the solutions and changing the way in which they market their drugs? So one company that made OxyContin, Purdue Pharma, influence the industry by marketing to the Federation of State Medical Boards and distributing a guideline on how to safely prescribe opioids. They did that through 21 different states. They influenced lead clinicians, over 1,050 lead, or I'm sorry, over 150,000 lead clinicians were influenced by them. <clears throat> They further went on to do direct-to-consumer advertising, and I'm going to give you some dollar amounts. Purdue Pharma spent, just one of the opioid manufacturers in 2016 spent $10 million on advertising their drug. In, I'm sorry, in 1996, they spent $10 million. In 1998, they spent $15 million. In 2001, they spent $30 million. Their profits, by the time we got to 2010, this one opioid manufacturer received in profits over $3.1 billion in profits. Now, I would ask you to reflect on what we're asking for. The industry itself makes roughly around $22 billion a year. We are asking them to pay a penny, a pill, with a multiplier for the more deadly opioids into a dedicated fund in our state to create the solutions for the opioid crisis in Minnesota, of which from 2015 to 2016 we had a 9.2% increase in opioid overdose deaths. As Mary was telling you, um, the NICU is filled with infants who are bo born dependent. Every single day at just HCMC alone, two babies enter into the NICU. Every day. 
The NICU cost for each infant is roughly around $2,000 a day. These costs are being paid for by our tax dollars. So it is absolutely a lie to state that when our legislators say we do not want to put a tax on the opioid crisis because it will burden the citizens of Minnesota. That is untrue. The burden is on the citizens of Minnesota right now. What this legislation would do is alleviate some of that burden from the taxpayers and put it onto the opioid industry. And even so, the penny a pill legislation is calling for revenue to be raised of about $20 million a year. That is nowhere near enough to even fund Hennepin County solutions. Another startling statistic that you should really, should really give you pause is that the number of bodies that Hennepin County is having to process has caused them to have to hire two more full-time medical examiners. Just the cost of the lab fees alone in Hennepin County has increased to $400,000 a year. Just the lab fees. So my question for our legislators would be, why in the House of Representatives have they completely stripped the accountability piece? The House of Representatives for our legislation has removed holding pharma accountable and instead they're asking for the funds to come out of the general operating dollars. That is our tax dollars. That is our taxes. And the Senate is waiting on the House to make a move. We have the support of our governor. I would ask that all of our constituents reach out to our legislators and ask them to be accountable. Instead of lifting the burden from the opioid industry, lift the burden from the taxpayers in terms of money, in terms of creating the solution so that we no longer have to have people dying, and in terms of helping all those hundreds of thousands of Americans that have been burdened by the way in which pharma has said that their product was safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, is, um, this is a really personal issue for me. My dad, has, over the last 20 years, has been in and out of recovery for uh, addiction to prescription painkillers. And I am sick and tired of politicians in both parties standing up and saying they're going to lead on issues like this and doing nothing about it. As you heard Lexi say, industry has a responsibility to help solve this epidemic that is ravaging this country and in this state right now. We know the costs are enormous, but the cost to people's lives and families is also enormous. And we are seeing families ripped apart at the seams in this state and this country because of this crisis, which industry and frankly politicians are willing to address. And let's make no mistake about it. When Tim Pawlenty says he wants to be a governor for business in this state, what is he really saying? What he's really saying is that he's going to let them off the hook. He's going to let industry off the hook like Big Pharma because those are the people funding his campaign. And so to bring it full circle here, the reason we're calling Tim Pawlenty out on this is because he has a responsibility as a standard bearer in their party right now to lead on this issue. And two weeks ago, when he said he was going to, he quickly changed his stripes, which again shouldn't surprise any of us who followed him for years. This guy has a tendency of speaking out of both sides of his mouth and saying he's going to lead and then not doing anything to lead. So we're calling on Tim Pawlenty, we're calling on Republican and DFL legislators to stand up and do the right thing. As Martin Luther King once said, it's always the right time to do the right thing. It's a penny a pill. 
This industry is making billions of dollars off the backs of dying people in our country. And it's time for Tim Pawlenty to grow a spine, stand up, and stand up to the special interests that are funding his campaign. Are there any questions? Uh, Senator Zelka the other day on this question said he thinks pharmaceutical companies are already paying enough in taxes uh, in Minnesota. He, he quoted some figure, I can't remember if it was two and a half million or something like that, but he made it more, but he said he thinks, he has no question that they're not already paying enough. John, it's a penny a pill into a dedicated fund that would then be able to be used to help address this opioid crisis. I don't think that's enough. It should be more than that. What we're asking for is a real minimal amount when you compare to what they're making off the backs of people who are addicted to opioids in this state. So I'm sure they're paying taxes. Uh, it's not enough. They should be doing more, and they shouldn't have a problem with this proposal. If I was in that industry, I would take us up on the offer to join hands in partnership and actually figure out how we can address this. Instead, we've essentially legalized drug pushers who are out there essentially pushing these, 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 these substances which are more addictive than any other substance out there, and our society thinks it's okay to have this destruction going on. We see it every single day, as Lexi said, you know, over a hundred people a day are dying in this country from opioid addiction. We need to address this. Other questions? Going forward, isn't the ultimate solution to change the way these drugs are prescribed? I'm going to turn that to Mary and Alexa. Yeah, I, I don't know enough. Okay. I recently um, read that actually um, the prescribing of opioids has decreased by 25%. I'm here to say that the physicians are taking this issue very seriously and doing their part, and we can, I can actually see it happening in our intensive cares. Um, it, it was almost like overnight that it was extra strength Tylenol around the clock, you know, uh, is, is ordered. And, um, half the amount of oxycodone is ordered. So we are, the medical field, both the physicians and the nurses, we recognize that for two decades, we followed this whole concept of zero pain, et cetera. And we are quickly going, no, we can't do this anymore. And we are, we are doing our part. Just to um, also answer a couple of other things to Mary's point, we still had 3.5 million opioid prescriptions dispensed in 2016. And we know for a fact that a third of the people that are prescribed to become addicted to these substance, to the pain pills. So a third of the individuals that are prescribed to become addicted, two thirds don't. So we're not saying that opioids should be abolished. They should be used for end of life. They should be used in acute settings. But for chronic pain, they do not work out of the hospital setting. Um, and the state has the DHS prescribing guidelines work group. And they are releasing guidelines that will require that doctors stay within the realm of the average, what they think is average for each incident to prescribe to, if they fall outside that realm, then they will be questioned as to why and action steps will be taken. So that should be released very soon to support our good prescribers in having a way to, to, to communicate to individuals who are seeking that medication. Summarize for me, if you could, the status of your understanding the status of this legislation. I know there's been some moving pieces here very recently. Where, where does it stand? What has happened? Well, um, so summarized, um, it has been tabled in the House, and it has been tabled in the Senate. And that was last week, was it not? Was right? Correct. It was tabled in the Senate last week and tabled again in the House last week. Yes, Sean? It was tabled in the Senate a few weeks ago after that finance committee hearing. Okay. And then in the House, we, we did have a, um, a hearing, and the advisory committee was amended. Yes. The A18-1 amendment, and now it's, and now it's tabled again. Okay. Yeah. Do you think it'll, and your fear, obviously, why you're here is that you could stay there. 
it could stay there. And and the other fear is that, you know, you all in this room know how tough it is to pass good public health and safety legislation. And if we pass something that is a um, pulling more money out of out of the general operating budget of health and human services, well, who are they going to take that from? Are they going to take that from the elderly? Are they going to take that from, um, I don't know, the school fund? Or where are they going to get that money from? And then is that a one-time fix of $15 million so that it, we know it won't be $20 million. We know that the proposed legislation in the House right now is at $16 million. And if it's 16 million, exactly how are they going to split that up against, uh, uh, distribute that amongst 87 counties to create any real solutions on a one time thing? And then everybody looks good and feels good, but we still haven't held pharma accountable. So then they pass legislation that makes everybody look like they're trying to create solutions. And I would propose to you all that the general constituent does not understand that that would mean it's still their tax dollars. This, this is this is the exact, this is why I said it's like Groundhog Day here, right? Because with Tim Pawlenty, we're going back into the same situation where you're so reflexive and uh, about any new revenue, any new tax, that what every proposal comes back to is pitting other priorities against other priorities in the general fund. And we can't get back into a situation where we're stealing from Peter to pay Paul, where we're taking from our schools and our nursing homes and, and our health care delivery system to fix a, a, a crisis that should be, frankly, borne on the shoulders of the industry that created it. And we're letting them off scot-free with no accountability. There's a larger issue here than just the opioid crisis. It's about, are we going to get back into this type of destructive budgeting again with Tim Pawlenty, where we're pitting priorities against priorities? The last eight years, we've made great strides getting away from that type of budgeting. The last thing we want to do is go right back into it because we're so anti-new revenue in this state or anti-tax or anti-holding business accountable that we end up pitting people against each other. It's wrong. It's not Minnesota. Let's see, a second ago you said one third of people who are prescribed opioids get addicted. Um, do, where do you get that from? I heard a, on the radio the other day on NPR somebody was saying it was 10%. Mm. Well, we got our stats from the CDC, Sean, was it two years ago? Um, yeah, I can answer it later. Yeah. Um, so. And that's nationwide? Yes. And that's patients who are prescribed opioids. Correct. Okay. Do you know? Do, are you aware of a ten percent number and where the? Is it, it's probably a definition of something. something semantic. Um, I'm not aware of. We're, I don't think we're aware of a ten percent number, but we'd, we'd be interested in reading about that. Um. Not the the one third was reported in 2015. Okay. Yeah. So, and I would also then just uh, um, you know remind everybody that the. Opioid industry, for them to pay $20 million to our state, it's not about the money for them. It's about culpability. So it's not that that would harm their bottom line. It's not that that would cause them to not be able to continue to produce their product for individuals that are end of life or acute care. It's that then it opens the floodgates for them to actually have to be held accountable. And it is time for our legislators to stop waiting for pharma to come to the table. That time has come and gone. It is now time to legislate that they be at the table to create the solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.